All right, welcome to the first of its kind, World Changing Manufacturers Network. Lisa Ryan has her ears to the ground and her heart in the game. Get ongoing education and new connections right here with Lisa and the Manufacturers Network. Buckle your seat, listen, and spread the word. Here's Lisa. Hey, it's Lisa Ryan. Welcome to the Manufacturers Network podcast. I'm excited to introduce you to our guest today, Fran Brunel. Fran is president and founder of Accelerated Manufacturing Brokers. She specializes in the sale of small and mid-sized manufacturing firms. With the goal of ensuring the continuity of U.S. manufacturing, Fran and her team help transition ownership to the next generation of entrepreneurs. Recently, Fran was named to the 2020 Most Influential Women in Mid-Market Mergers and Acquisitions. Fran is also the host of WAM, Women and Manufacturing Podcast. She writes on topics that help manufacturing business owners prepare their companies for sale, and navigate the sales process to ensure a positive financial result in support of their retirement. So Fran, welcome to the show. Hey, thank you so much for having me. It's good to be with you today. So Fran, share with us a little bit about your background and what path led you to working with manufacturers and getting into the selling of manufacturing businesses. Sure. So we just passed in April our 27th year anniversary. I Congratulations. 12 people. <laughs> um, so we started, I actually started out my career serving the manufacturing community as an industrial auctioneer. So selling the manufacturing equipment that the businesses use that I currently sell. Often a manufacturer who needed an auction, there was some sort of need for speed. And it was normally because they were in financial trouble. But the companies that were buying equipment from us were growing, thriving, constantly rotating out their equipment for newer pieces or better brands. And eventually, at their behest, we started our journey as M&A professionals, as those buyers said to us, hey, I need to retire. I want you to sell my business or help me find a company to acquire to facilitate my own company's growth. And for a while, we ran both divisions and we we started to really hit our stride in manufacturing M&A. And at the point where we grew over 400% three years running, we said goodbye to, to auctions. I also really like the, the M&A practice. You're really helping to transition ownership of manufacturing to a different generation of entrepreneur, ensuring that the company goes on and the jobs go on. So it's a much different gig than auctioning. I remember very early in my career, I used to kind of say, God, this cannot be my purpose in life. I'm the grim reaper, really? But over time, the skills that I learned in the auction industry and learning about manufacturers and the machine tools and what does what, you know, it was a process. I would never be able to do what I do today to help the manufacturers retire in wealth if I had did not have that basis to understand manufacturing. So... Well, and from a standpoint of succession planning, there's a lot of my clients, and I know that you find out the rest, that they don't have, their children may have no interest in the business. There isn't a succession plan. So even though on this podcast, we really talk about employee retention and engagement and finding employees and all these steps, but as we were talking before the show, when you set your business up for sale at some point in the future, now or in the future, you're gonna have all those processes in place where you're gonna have happy staffs, where you've done workforce development. So the things that you can do now to perhaps sell your company in the future are what you need right now to attract and retain good employees. So yeah, share a little bit about what you're seeing as far as 
the good things that these companies are doing for their workforce development and creating that culture. One of the things I, I enjoy talking about and just an observation from traveling the entire country selling manufacturing companies is that, you know, everybody talks about a skills gap. A lot of people complain about it, but not a lot of people do something about it. Companies, manufacturing companies that are proactive in their communities, engaging with the high schools, engaging with the trade schools are are not having the same types of problems as others that are not. It's you have to be involved. If you're waiting as a manufacturer to for somebody else to do it, for the government to do it, it ain't gonna happen, sweetie. You know, right. you have to take action. And we've, we've just seen some wonderful things. A company that we sold down in Carolina, the owner was very involved with the local high school. They had a work study program where the students could go and basically try out in, in a career that they thought they might be interested in. And he would start them, the owner would start them doing some menial tasks, but if they showed work ethic, he then would move them to shadow a machinist, a setup guy, someone doing solid works, depending on where the student's interest lied. And if they determined that this was a career path that they wanted, he would take them down to the local trade school. He would help them, the trade school would assist the student in applying for any grants that might exist if there was no grant available for the student, my client would pay for their education with the promise that they would stay with him for a short period of time afterwards. And it's very funny, I remember saying to him, so you're paying for these students' educations. Aren't you afraid that they're going to leave and go to a competitor? And his response to me was, well, you know what? Shame on me if they do, because I've not created a culture that they want to stay in. Wow. Yeah. That and is... he had um, a delightful program staff. It was such a wonderful mix of, of some guys middle age, but some very young firecrackers coming up through the process. Things like this, workforce engagement, not just doing things to try to address the skills gap and pull them in, but then creating an environment that they want to stay in. Those companies, I've been doing this 27 years, those companies sell faster and at better prices. Wow. If a buyer walks into a manufacturing company and sees everyone has gray hair and half, you know, they're walking around with a cane because they're about to croak. Buyers and, and acquisition lenders see danger in that. And you cannot wait as a manufacturer until you are right up at that point to start to address it. It takes years to address these things. Well, and it's interesting when you talked about that client, because a couple things that he obviously did very well, a lot of manufacturers don't know that you can work with the workforce development sections of your local community college or tech schools and basically design the exact employees that you want, putting together the programs so that you can customize those employees. So building those relationships, you're going to have a one up on the competition because they're already there. But the fact that he's paying for the education, he's creating that culture, he's basically taking any of the competitors out of the market right there because this employee has shadowed, they have followed the management, he's already invested them, he's showing them that he sees something in them that maybe nobody else has ever seen before. So there's that there's that fear of, well, I'm going to spend all this money to train these people and then they're going to leave. And good for him for realizing the fact of, no, it's still up to you. You still create the type of culture that keeps them there. But for the people listening, this is not something that happened overnight. This is something he's invested that time. He's invested in those relationships. And I'm sure that whenever he is ready or was ready to sell, that company probably went rather quickly and at a really good price. 
<laughs> you know what? We had four different offers, all over list price. That man got to choose who he wanted to sell to. And the company that bought them is fabulous. It was a, it was a, um, um, uh, and it, two individual buyers leaving corporate America. One had been CEO of a publicly traded company. And so these, the staff members are now exposed to educational opportunities that they never would have otherwise been exposed to. Fabulous company. Well, and so, it's so interesting too, when you look through, when you talk about what people see, what these buyers and lenders are seeing as they're walking through an organization. Do you have a wide range of people? Do you have a diverse staff? Do you have a diverse team of all different ages, including those young kids that are coming up and bringing that energy to it? Because we can feel culture. I mean, you can walk into a plant and you can feel if people want to be there or not versus again, the, the people that are just about to retire, who would want to buy that? And you have people that are in that retirement mode who might be thinking, well, why should I make friends with these young kids? They're just going to be gone in six weeks anyway. Well, what if you made friends with them and built those relationships and like that owner connected with them and made them feel valued? That's what keeps them there. Yeah, that's right. One other thing I would say about involvement with, with schools in your community, you know, everyone thinks it's difficult to do this. You know, listen, the schools are struggling too. I've had clients that have actually, they participate so much that they've donated machine tools to the trade school. And as a result of that, one particular client got to have his banner placed up on the wall of the, of the, the machine tool school. So, it, you know, who do you think students are going to call? With it? You know, and he gets he gets the cream of the crop because he shows the, the community school that they really care about the student development. And I'm sure he gets the call before his competitors do. Right. You know, you well, do strategic planning in every other area manufacturers, do it in this one. <laughs> exactly. Now, yeah, what are some act of the, like you have competition because you do. Exactly. So what are some of the biggest mistakes that you see companies making? It is a very interesting subject because what makes a manufacturer successful also makes them incredibly easy to sell and they sell at a higher price. So there's any number of things, right? There's, you know, we talked about workforce development. Uh, another topic would be, you know, modernizing your equipment. Manufacturing had a bad reputation for several decades for a reason, <laughs> right? And it's not like that today. And hopefully we can get the message out that it's not, it's not a dirty old machine shop. Some of the places we visit are, are clean room hospital-esque. They're modern work environments. We just took a deal under contract in the Midwest. They have done fabulous things with continually modernizing their equipment and bringing robotics in. And everybody is afraid that robotics is going to take away jobs. Well, in, in this particular instance, there was, um, there was a, a job that it was the least favorite job in this machine shop. And it had to do with the weight of the metal piece that had to be put into the CNC machine. And so my clients said, okay, let's see what technology we can apply to this. So that we don't have this issue of nobody wanting to do this job. When you walk into their facility, it's funny, you talk about atmosphere, how you can sniff instantly a good atmosphere. Well, that was this place. And they, they instituted robotic cells and that's the first thing you see when you come in. And they, my client said that it was the best recruiting tool they ever had <laughs> because the young people come in and they're like, wow, this is amazing. I didn't expect this. And beyond that, it's a wonderful, clean environment. They have documented procedures. 
everyone knows what to expect. There's financially, there's bonuses relative to performance and and they, they treat their people right. So those are all things that make a difference. And beyond that, there's, we have blog articles, so many different things. I think a recent blog article I did had 15 different points that help a manufacturing company to sell well. And there are things like customer concentration, sector concentration. In some industries, that's very hard to avoid. For instance, if you're in the aerospace sector, if you're doing anything of relevance, you're going to have a customer concentration because there's only so many big players in the industry. In other areas, buyers and lenders will will look for less customer concentration. But there's, yeah, there's a whole host of things that really matter. But workforce development, skills gap is one of the largest. When you're seeing your these companies that are investing in that workforce development what are some of the the best ideas or the best tips that you would give to somebody listening today as far as focusing on that area i think one of the things that i would say is to expose someone coming in a student say you know do it on a on a work program expose them to any number of things I have two different clients in the past would start workers out in high school, you know, as I described earlier, but they would rotate them around the entire shop. And then once they were trained on everything, the person could gravitate to what they most were interested in and where they had a bent, right? And so what happens, though, is the manufacturer ends up with a whole team of people that are cross-trained. So if someone's calling out sick or whatever, you're, you're not afraid of that because you have a fully trained team that's skilled in, in every type of machining. That's probably the most important thing I would say. Yeah. And not only from a cross-training standpoint, but there you're also giving your employees to find the job that lights them up. I mean, they may have applied for one particular job that they thought would be okay and might have kept them there for a little while. But by having the opportunity to go around the shop and having a say in what they do, because that is not a common practice. So when you can differentiate yourself over what everybody else is doing, when you're all competing for this exact same employees in a lot of cases, all of these little things that you can do and and cross training is such a win win. Mm-hmm. It's funny you just what you said you reminded me of an interview that I did for the Women in Manufacturing podcast with a woman from uh, Coke Industries, and she told me that a delightful story. One of their employees, I forget where what state he was in, but his job was basically loading tractor trailers every day with paper products, toilet paper that was being shipped all over the country, right? This gentleman had an interest in technology and he, today he is where he designed the computer programs that the, the entire process in that plant is now automated, but that man, wrote the program to accomplish all of that. And they, you know, they gave him the autonomy to to work towards what he was most interested in. And I I just found that to be a touching and a really great story and good example for for other companies. You know, sometimes you have talent, you hire a person for one thing and they end up being fabulous at something else, but you've got to give them the room to discover that. Exactly. Well, that is such a great tip to, as we're coming to the end of our time together. So tell us a little bit about how you work with your clients and what's the best way to get in touch with you. In the M&A sale process, we represent the seller. We don't represent buyers. We get that request a lot. But our goal is to 
help the manufacturer. Often the buyers are private equities, much larger corporations. Sometimes they have teams of attorneys. My interest is in helping the manufacturer and protecting them through the process and making sure that the jobs stay in the community. So that, that's basically how we work. We will run a potential client through a valuation process. They will know before we ask them for a listing, they will know we will have provided them with an opinion of value of their company. And we will do that without charge. Now, some people come into the process and they're perhaps smaller than I have an audience for, and I'll tell them that up front. But again, we've got, you know, my interest, my industry is interesting in that many work where you're paying tens of thousands of dollars up front to find out what is my manufacturing company worth and how long is it going to take you to sell it and what are you going to do to sell it? And what is the whole process like? We're going we're gonna to work with you to understand these things up front and walk you through an educational process so that you are completely prepared for anything that's going to happen in the M&A process. Wonderful. And what's the best way for people to get in touch with you? Best way, um, you can visit our website, acceleratedmfgbrokers.com. Or you can simply call us, 908-387-1000. Well, Fran, it has been an absolute pleasure to have you on the show with me today. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. It was a joy. I'm Lisa Ryan, and this is the Manufacturers Network Podcast. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening. Hey, do me a favor. If you like what you've heard, please subscribe and give us a five-star rating. Also, feel free to share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so we can grow the network and connect more fantastic folks just like you. You can either go to the website at manufacturers-network.com or share the podcast on your LinkedIn, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or wherever you and your industry friends hang out. The bigger and faster we grow this network, the stronger and deeper community we will have. I appreciate you. Thank you.